Hey folks, it is a beautiful day in Ohio and I'm about to tap some maple trees. So when the nights are below freezing and the days are above freezing, preferably in the 40s and sunny, that gets enough pressure built up behind the sap so that it flows enough and we can capture it. I use food grade plastic buckets and I do about five. That seems to work for us. It's just a small hobby for me and so it's just for personal use and sometimes I give away a jar or two for gifts. But this is the way that I collect it and so I have these lids that I've drilled holes into and that is so it can accommodate the tubing that I use to collect the sap from the tree and so attached to these tubes are what we call spiles or it's a tap that goes into the tree this right here and so I use a 5 16 inch uh, drill bit and I have it marked with tape at about an inch and a half, that's the depth we want to penetrate the tree to hit the vascular system so that we can tap the sap. And so I already have everything sanitized and ready to go. The use of proper sanitation is important. I sanitize all my equipment with one step before beginning. I like this because there's no rinsing required. It doesn't leave any kind of a residue or taste or smell. There are myriad of spiles and collection containers, so do a little research to see what best suits your needs. And so I have about a dozen or so silver maple trees on my property. Sugar maples are the preferred source because they have a higher sugar content, but you can tap any maple tree as well as birch and black walnut. You don't want to mix the syrups, but many trees uh, provide a decent sap to make syrups, different flavors, of course. I just tend to stick with maple. In fact, my grandparents used to own this land and it was named Maple Shade Farm. And so I'm going to take this bucket out and then we'll start tapping. First, we need to identify healthy maple trees with a diameter of at least 10 inches. You can consult your local extension office to help identify maple trees in your area along with other helpful info. Look for trees that are in good overall health and preferably located in areas with good sunlight exposure. While sap can be collected from any maple trees, sugar and black maple are preferred since the sugar content of their sap is higher than other maple species. With sugar maple, it takes about 43 gallons of sap to produce one gallon of syrup. The lower the sugar content of the sap, the more gallons of sap that are needed to produce a gallon of syrup. Also, the lower the sugar content, the more fuel and time it will take to boil down the sap. Now, depending on the types of trees that you're going to use, late winter to early spring is the ideal time for tapping. This is when temperatures fluctuate below freezing at night and thawing during the day, with the ideal temperatures being around 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 degrees Celsius for maximum sap flow. Sap can be collected for syrup production until just before the tree buds begin to expand. This is usually sometime in February through early April, depending on the type of maple, the weather, and your location. Sap collected and processed into syrup after the buds break or after they flower results in a very bitter product. Right, so the first thing I like to do is locate my maple tree and you want to drill on the south side of the tree where the sun's warming things up. You can actually see past holes where we've drilled into here. It heals up pretty quickly. I like to make sure that my bucket is on level ground so that it won't teeter as it's filling up. Uh, until there's sap in there, the bucket is kind of unwieldy, and so I like to use a rock just to keep that steady until it starts to fill with sap, and then it pretty much holds its own. You want to go up at a slight angle. I didn't think the sap was flowing, but it just started. There we go. It's just a little bit of a an exciting moment every year when that first sap flows. There it goes. And they're very tight, which is good. We don't want rain getting into there. Usually push it down a few inches just to make sure it's in there pretty good and make sure I have a rock or a brick. Sap is flowing.
So once again, with a 5 16 inch bit, I drill into the tree between one and a half to two inches in depth at a slight angle and I make sure to keep the drill running to help remove any of the shavings. If sap's flowing, then it usually starts dripping within a few seconds. Then I insert the spile and use a hammer to tap it in, trying to prevent any leaking. It's one of the first few trees that I planted from seed, no less, from surrounding trees. Now once the taps are in place, it's important to keep a close eye on sap flow. If you're using tubing like I do, it's important to make sure that it's properly installed and maintained. Sap should be collected as quickly as possible. Keep in mind that if the sap warms up, bacteria can colonize and grow. I typically check my buckets every other day or so, depending on how fast the sap is flowing. If the temperatures rise too much, the sap could spoil, and it will stop flowing at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. If it's warm and you can't keep the sap cold, such as covering it with snow in the shade, then boiling should be done often to prevent bacterial growth and spoilage. Filtering before evaporating is important to remove any debris. I use these filters at every stage of the process and that just keeps things cleaner. They are washable and reusable. And now for the exciting part. Sap is boiled to evaporate water content, turning the sap into syrup. It is necessary to filter out impurities along the way and to monitor the temperature very carefully. The evaporation process will go through several different stages until it reaches that rich golden maple syrup. There are a variety of ways to evaporate the syrup. Boiling is best done outdoors though, due to the amount of steam that's produced. It can fill up your house with lots of water if you're not careful, though I do often finish inside. I have used a turkey fryer and a steamer pan over hot plates. You can also build a fireplace out of block and put a pan over the wood fire. Oftentimes barrel stoves can be modified to support a pan for boiling. The possibilities are endless. And sap becomes syrup at about seven and a half degrees above the boiling point of water. Now this is usually 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but this can change based on the barometric pressure, on the elevation in which you live. And so you can confirm the temperature by doing a test boil of water and documenting that temperature. Another useful tool is a hydrometer. This instrument is used to measure the density of syrup, but using temperature is fine if you don't have one of those. It's also necessary to filter at 216 degrees Fahrenheit. This removes the niter or sugar sand. It's a naturally occurring sediment in the sap. And I use this filter kit. It makes it nice and convenient. There are a couple of lightweight filters and a heavyweight filter. And I also have on hand some other lightweight filters that I use for filtering beeswax, kitchen grease, those kind of things. And so I just use the lightweight filters to remove the sugar sand and then I'll use the heavyweight filter at the very end right before I get ready to pour it into the jars. When the sap reaches the syrup temperature which is 219.5 degrees Fahrenheit at my particular location then I do one last filter and transfer it into the jars while still hot. It's important to jar it up when it's about 180 to 185 degrees and if you're using mason jars like this then that will help the lid form a seal onto the jar and then it becomes shelf stable though it is important to refrigerate it once you have opened it it will spoil if left at room temperature once that seal has been broken if this is your first experience, it's always a good idea to consult your local state extension office. They will have documents for region specific tips and recommendations. Following best practices will lead to a successful maple syrup making experience. Making maple syrup is an example of a self-sufficient practice where you can produce a significant portion of your sweetener needs locally. This contributes to a sense of self-sufficiency and reduces reliance on mass-produced, commercially processed sweeteners. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. Thank you so much for stopping by.